Geek Therapy Radio. Welcome to the Geek Therapy Radio podcast. I am your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger, and I just watched the new trailer for Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, and I mean, there's no spoilers I can give you from the trailer, but really the only thing that that popped in my mind and this is sort of a sort of a confession is uh i this is a geek confession i really really need to catch up on my star wars honestly you know we're all geeks about something and i certainly appreciate star wars uh, I can't tell you the last one that I watched. And as I've said on the show before, once or twice, j- just half in jest, is that it feels like there's so many Star Warses. So many Star War- Wars, plural. I just dropped a screw on the carpet and Jack is in here, my cat. And I hope he doesn't eat it. So I'm going to multitask for this podcast and making sure that he doesn't swallow a screw because he is that stupid and he just might it's a screw food it's good that's what jack sounds like are you doing your podcast should i meow on your podcast <laughs> am i being too mean to a cat i don't think i am because if you ever met jack if, scratch that if you met jack you would love Jack. If you lived with Jack, you would share my sentiment for him, which is that he's dumb. And usually the dumb cats wind up being the ones that live past 20 years old. So we're in the long haul for Jack. So anyways, back to back to what I was talking about. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just behind on my Star Wars. We all know how Star Wars ends. But this huge, long list of, to me, it was seemingly endless Star Wars prequels. Nothing against them at heart. I mean, they are visually stunning. And the preview for Rise of Skywalker looks really good. The actual visuals of the preview. I've seen mixed reviews of the preview. Like, there's mixed reviews of anything else. There's always going to be some people saying that the new star wars movie looks like a pile of crap there's going to be people that say the new star wars looks like it's going to be great and then there are the star star wars diehards who say even if it is crap i am going to go see it and i will love it for the very basis that it is a star wars film new official canon in the star wars uh canon <laughs> <laughs> for some reason I was going to say trilogy but it's so far beyond a trilogy it's Star Wars is not a trilogy you thought it was going to be a trilogy and then we got Jar Jar Binks alright let's move on to more geek news Jack update he is now chewing on my headphone cable what an idiot Jack update number two He is now lying on my headphone cable, so I have limited range of movement of my neck. Jack, give me some slack. (sighs) You know what the sad part about all of this is, besides everything? Is that when, God willing, that my podcast lasts this long... That my radio show lasts this long. That Geek Therapy Radio exists in any form or another that long. One day Jack's going to die. And it's going to be a very, very sad, somber day. And I'm going to have to get on this microphone and tell all of you that Jack, the infamous Jack, has ceased to be. That he has left this mortal coil. But... (laughs) 
As it always is for the stupidest of cats, he lives on forever. And let me just remind you that I have talked about Jack on my actual radio show. So aliens, a thousand light years away, a million light years away, will be theori- will theoretically be able to tune in to the broadcast of me talking about my stupid cat, Jack. So he will live forever as the electromagnetic waves propagate themselves through this universe. Alien ears, alien auditory receptors, alien electromagnetic receptors will know the glory and infamy that is Jack. Man, he has a stupid face looking at me. By the way, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker is in theaters December 20th, 2019. Carrie Fisher's in it. I mean, if anything, going back to what I was mentioning earlier, people saying, oh, the new Star Wars trailer looks like a big pile of... The S word. Since I don't know who's listening to this, it's PG. Carrie Fisher's in it. Of course, anybody who has even a remote interest in Star Wars or memories with Star Wars, depending on how old you are, especially Princess Leia. Princess Leia. Yeah, not to be... Um, I'm searching through my little diction, my mental dictionary here. <laughs> not to be too... Uh, um, I really search for the wide word, right word. Mm. Not to be too crass. I'll just keep it simple. Not to be too crass. But a lot of little boys and some little girls grew up with Princess Leia. And Princess Leia and Daisy Duke and Vera Fawcett, and, <laughs> um, can I mention this? Uh, um, Elvira, <laughs> to a much lesser degree, maybe, perhaps, I don't know. I don't mean lesser degree in, uh, you know what, before I get myself into trouble, I'm going to just leave it at many young boys and some young girls figured out Let's just say what team they play for with the ladies from the 70s and 80s. Let's just let's just say. And I've probably incriminated myself way too much with that. Let's move on. All I wanted to say, December 20th, 2019, New Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. And all I was getting at is that Carrie, this is the last one. I mean, I see. I struggle to say last one because who knows what Star Wars makes money. But this might be the last time you see Carrie Fisher in an official Star Wars movie. That is, if they don't resurrect her with you know uh, CGI and what have you. Which I, I hate saying that because it does. It does sound crass. It does sound vulgar, kind of to say that. But when there's money to be made, if there's a financial interest, if they think they can get some mileage out of resurrecting Carrie Fisher for anything else, any other installments in the Star Wars universe, I mean, why? It's not crazy of me to say, speculate that they may actually do that. That's not crazy at all. At any rate, Carrie Fisher was alive when they started filming this movie. So, this may be our last chance to see her officially in a Star Wars movie in the flesh. Rest in peace, Carrie Fisher. Alright, now we'll move on to another story. And I promise it's not Jack, unless he does something stupid. Elon Musk. I One of my routines each day, as... This, this is an old phrase that goes back to when Daniel SSSSS and I were roommates. Daniel SSSSS has been on the rate on Geek Therapy Radio a few times in the past. And one of the things we'd say is we get our coffee in the morning or whatever and meet each other in the attic, which is where our computers were. I had my studio up there and he had his computer. We would check our sites. Quote, check our sites. 
which meant, and this was back in like 2010 or something around there, we would check Facebook and check uh, if we still had a lot of MySpace, check our email, stuff like that. We had to check our sites. Part of the routine of the day, check your sites. So this morning when I was checking my sites, I saw a tweet from, excuse me, Elon Musk, <laughs> Elon Musk um, that he tweeted via SpaceX's Starlink broadband satellite network and basically said this is a test of what did he say oh i'm sure it's, it's quoted here i don't remember it off the top of my mind um yeah sending this tweet through space via starlink satellite uh via starlink satellite with and a text two minutes later that just said whoa it worked <laughs> so that was one of the first tweets that i saw today by the way side note why do I see so many freaking tweets from Donald Trump? And I know that sounds stupid for me to say that. He's the president and he is notorious for his Twitter usage. But I don't follow Donald Trump. I don't follow any politicians that I know of. I'm a, who do I follow? I don't know. I definitely do not follow Donald Trump. I am not holding it against you if you support Donald Trump. I'm not holding it against you if you voted for Donald Trump or if you're going to vote for him again. I don't hold it against you if you voted for Hillary Clinton. I don't hold it against you if you want to vote for Bernie Sanders. I truly do not care about that. You know my stance on Geek Therapy Radio is that we have so much more in common than who we vote for. If you vote want to vote for Bernie Sanders and somebody else wants to vote for Donald Trump, that is just one difference. There are so many other things that we have in common. So many other geek things and hobbies that we can share and take a mutual interest in. Who you vote for in your politics is just one piece of the totem pole that makes you unique and what makes you you. So anyways, I see a lot of tweets from Donald Trump and I don't know why. I don't follow Donald Trump. I guess I could hit the silence thing. Can you, you can, you can silence tweets or something, right? Can't you? I can limit the, what I see but from, from Donald Trump, but I, I don't care that much. I'm just wondering, why, why are there so many tweets that I see from Donald Trump? And it will say, you know, on Twitter, um, this person, this person, this person, and f 55 more of your followers follow Donald Trump. Okay, great. Why, so why am, I, why am I seeing it all the time? Why? Why do I need to see all this po political stuff? And then I remember, oh, Twitter's a cesspool. It's an absolute garbage dumpster fire heap of trash of the worst of the worst of human intellect being broadcast in the universe. That being said, Elon Musk tweeted through the Satellite Starlight Network. And I don't think Elon Musk is putting up his garbage brain thoughts onto Twitter. He was testing the Starlink satellite. Because the big news there, and I've talked about Starlink once or twice in the past, is that it aims to offer basically worldwide broadband internet. Um, before worldwide, Elon Musk and SpaceX aims to offer it in the U.S. by mid-2020. So, I'll repeat that, mid-2020. So next year, satellite-based broadband high-speed internet. The, the biggest... Um, Hurdle to me, I guess, the biggest concern in my mind, and by the way, this is going to consist of just about 12,000 satellites in orbit around the Earth. Uh, SpaceX launched 60 of them in May of this year uh, before the wider rollout over the coming years. Um, it, it, it's, they're seeking to do up to 30,000, if not more, satellites in total, the FCC has granted permission thus far to deploy around 12,000, but SpaceX is seeking to deploy up to and more than 30,000, all things said and told. Again, my biggest concern with all this is the latency, is ping, because yes, the speed of light is very fast and, and ba basically radio transmission operates at the speed of light. You you can keep your ping low with your broadband internet if you are communicating to a server or an ISP or ev everything in the signal chain is within a few hundred miles of each other. Let's say you're playing um, Dota 
with another team and the other team so happens to be just 100 miles away or you're all clustered within a few hundred square miles of each other your pings all said and told on the server are going to be pretty low versus when you have a ping when you're if you're playing somebody from australia let's say i'm playing rocket league here in houston texas with somebody who is in australia then i'm going to rely on satellites and and way more links in the chain and lots of distance so that introduces latency so if your broadband internet service which by the way is aimed to start at 80 dollars a month but if it's based on satellites if you are not communicating with a physical cable connection throughout the signal chain and it's just it's going into space at some point that uh round trip to me seems like would introduce quite a bit of latency not counting any hardware issues in computing and and whatnot that goes on into it so spacex says that it intends to provide gigabit speed with latency as low as 25 uh, milliseconds now at you know at a at first glance 25 milliseconds doesn't seem too bad but then i go on to ookla speed test just with my smartphone you know what i'm gonna run a real world speed test right now on geek therapy radio i use xfinity which is the lesser of the evils in Houston. Xfinity is still terrible in its own right. <laughs> I hope Xfinity... Watch them sponsor me next week. Uh, anyways, uh, why can't I type in? My batteries are dying on my freaking keyboard. So anyways, uh, Xfinity is is way less bad than AT&T. In, in my experience. So, SpaceX... Um, SpaceX promises that it's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry guys and gals, Starlink, promises Starlink it's going to offer up latency as low as 25 milliseconds. Let's see what I'm getting right now, real world, as I'm recording, as Dropbox is updating and everything's going on, I've got all these tabs open in, in Chrome, I'm going to hit go on Ookla speed test and see what my ping is right now. And before I hit go, I'll let you know that I am hardwired into my router, which is hardwired into my modem. But I am running through a 100 foot at least uh, Cat 6 cable, 100 feet. So I'm just letting you know that's all the inherent latency. But I am hardwired. I'm going to hit go right now. Ping, 13 milliseconds. Download. It's still climbing. 300. Let's see the final count. 320. 300. 329.79 megabits per second. What is that divided by 8? 3, 330 divided by 8. 330 divided by 8. That's 41 and a quarter megabytes per second download. Upload is 12 megabits per second, so that's one and a half megabytes per second, doing the math in my head. Eight carry the four is 1.5. And, but the, it doesn't matter, the ping, the ping is the important thing. 13 milliseconds for my hardwired connection between my computer, the ISP, and whatever server, it says it's in Houston, Comcast server. So that begs the question, that, and that's the main concern in my mind. Okay, Starlink, that sounds really cool. And the, the benefit of it is that, I, I mean, I guess you're just going to be connected to it wherever you are in the world uh, in the future, in the near future. Right now, it's going to U.S. broadband. They're going to basically be testing it out on U.S. customers. But the, you don't need a modem. That's the whole point of it, is you don't, you can just attach your phone to your Starlink uh, connection, perhaps even bypassing, for all intents and purposes, your your mobile data provider. If you're on T-Mobile, whatever, what have you, maybe the Starlink connection is going to be faster. So making calls over Wi-Fi all the time, even though it's not really technically why, technically Wi-Fi. Um. Anyways, so I just wanted to bring that up. 
Will it the latency get better than 25 milliseconds? I don't know. I'd have to do some math in my head. Speed of light and where the satellites are going to officially rest in the sky. It all depends on their actual physical distance. And that's the point I was getting at. With the latency, You have if you have a satellite a few hundred miles overhead, then the latency can only be so good because the speed of light is only so fast. And the farther away your point of contact is with your ISP, and if your ISP is in space, that's latency. And I'm not, I'm not meaning to poo-poo Starlink. It's a really cool idea, especially not, not because of the U.S. rollout, but because of what it means for the rest of the world. That means you can be in some remote village so far away from other civilization let's say in africa or central america or something and no matter where you are on earth instead of relying on a satellite phone you have starlink you have high speed broadband internet that covers every conceivable square inch of the surface of the earth that is a huge statement i just made that is massive that's a big deal All right, let's move on to more things. Um, Dutch airline KLM would like to introduce um, a new passenger airplane into the public domain for public air travel by 2040, and it's a flying V. I have brought this up. I have brought this up at least once a year ago or so when this story first came out of the concept for this airplane. And the big takeaway from it, flying V. So think about the design of a flying V. It's not a traditional fuselage. Let's think of a traditional airplane that's shaped like a pencil with wings on it. The passengers sit on the central axis of rotation, meaning when the plane banks left or right, the seats on the furthest outside of the fuselage raise a few feet this way, a few feet that way, if that And it's the effect of that motion, that seesaw motion that you feel in your seat is relatively minimal when you sit so close to the axis of rotation. A flying V where, let's say you're you're sitting in the back of the airplane, which means you are at the very edge of that V shape. Let's say the the plane banks to the left or right. You ain't just going up or down a couple feet. You are flying up and down dozens of feet quickly. It's going to be like riding a roller coaster. So that is what is going to take some engineering. And they're going to have to figure that out. It's all fine and dandy. Oh, the wing shape or the the shape of the airplane is more efficient. And oh, you burn less fuel and all all this. Well, if your passengers are just puking all over themselves, no one's going to want to fly the dang thing. People are still going to prefer the traditional airplane design if... They're seated, oh my goodness, I'm seated in row 36. That means I am way in the aft of the airplane. That means when we take even a slight banking turn, I am going to be flying up in the air. Whoa! And then when the plane returns to level flight, woo, I'm going to fall like a roller coaster 30 more feet. Just instantly, or very quickly, you're going to lose your lunch. Passengers are going to get very sick. So what is the solution there? On the one hand, putting the passengers on the very edge, trailing edges of this shape means that the interior, you can have like lounges and a big open area on the inside. And you think, well, why not just put passengers on the inside? Well, then you can't see out of the plane. Or maybe they could put some video screens or monitors. There's going to be a lot of wasted space in this design. I'll just say that. There's a lot of wasted space in this design. And any aeronautical engineer would agree with that. But Johnny, we have flying V aircraft. That's right. And the crew sits right in the front of the aircraft, right in the very tip of the nose of it, so they don't feel the effects. Nobody in a B-17 B-117 bomber is sitting out at the tailing edge of the of the wingtip. They're all crammed up front. Why aren't they at the wingtips? Because they would puke all over themselves all the time and get dizzy and pass out and be susceptible to more G-forces. And it's bad news bears to be sitting at the edge of a flying V-shaped airplane. That's all I wanted to say about that. This story popped up again, and it popped up again in my mind that, oh, they're still serious about this? 2040, they're saying. 
That's 20 years from now. Maybe they'll figure it out in 20 years from now. Or maybe it's just one of those pie-in-the-sky things. V-shaped pie-in-the-sky things that just won't won't turn out. My, my money's betting on that. Passenger travel in a V-shaped aircraft? Hmm. Not unless they put the passengers. I can't think of... The other option is in the next 20 years, maybe we'll figure out anti-gravity. Maybe they can cancel the effects of gravity at the edge of the aircraft. So you don't still feel anything. You're at a constant 1G all the time. <laughs> you could do a barrel roll and not feel anything. I, am, I think I'm going to wrap it up with that. A couple, two or three stories, I think that's good. Talked about Jack for a few minutes, which is way, it's a few minutes too long. Where is he? Gotta make sure he doesn't chew on cables. We think that he's the way he is because he's chewed on one too many electrical cables. I have not seen him get electrocuted. I just theorized that before I entered the picture, he uh, probably got electrocuted. It would explain a lot. He has huge fangs like a saber tooth, and he doesn't know how to play fight. So when he bites you, he just bites with 100% force all the time. He doesn't know what a playful nip is. He just bites with, he just cranks down on you and it hurts and there's puncture wounds and he's loud and he's fat and his butthole smells. <laughs> All right. Oh, if you, the more keen of you may have noticed that I deleted my most recent upload. I'm going to re-upload that um, for reasons. The meat and potatoes of what I said is in there. I'm just cutting out a few minutes for obvious reasons. If you downloaded it and have an A and B comparison, you'll know what I cut out and you'll know why I cut it out. And probably those of you who listened to it were probably thinking through that section. Man, you're getting pretty ballsy, Johnny. This is pretty ballsy of you to be venting about this. I understand about venting on other things, but this part, you may want to. Wow. So, yeah, I cut it out. And it's nothing. It was nothing saucy or juicy. It was just, um, well, I'll leave it at that. You didn't really miss anything, but I'm going to re-upload it. It's about me uh, venting on how I was feeling when I recorded it. Uh, the self-doubt that I was battling with that day. And I talked for about an hour about it. I've whittled it down. I think it's around 40 minutes or so now. I've cut out several minutes of it when I was talking about something that maybe I shouldn't be talking about for reasons. So I guess you go back and listen to it. It's the podcast titled... Um, something about self-doubt. I battled self-doubt today or something like that. But at any rate, we'll wrap it up here. Be good to yourselves and others. Please remember, and it's something I reminded myself in that podcast, which I re-upload, you're worthy of love. You're worthy of giving and receiving love, and that's something I need to remind myself of, of too, that I am worthy of love, and I am worthy of receiving and giving love. That I shouldn't self-doubt myself <laughs> about trying to put goodness out into the universe and being conflicted about doing that and trying to make a living at it at the same time. But well, we, believe me, I deep dive into that in that other podcast. So make sure you you listen to that one. Remember, we're all geeks about something, so embrace your inner geek i have a few recordings from some uh, co-workers and friends that i'm going to play in uh, some upcoming podcasts um also i just finished my quantum computing show uh i have um a professor from university of houston a phd talking about quantum computing and it's a very fascinating show that is going to drop on friday it's going to air on saturday make sure you stay tuned for that and uh, before I give you too many other titillating news, I'll save that for tomorrow. So uh, until next time, be good to yourselves and others. Know that you're worthy of love, and I'll see you tomorrow. Geek Therapy Radio. Saturday night at 10 on KPRC 950 or listen anytime on our iHeartRadio app.